Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to Talking with Traders. This is the fifth season of the podcast to take us up to the end of 2022. Thanks to all our loyal listeners for returning and welcome to all our new listeners. As before, IG Markets have come on board as sponsors of this podcast. We're truly grateful to have such an award-winning CFD provider as sponsor alongside us. In this season, I'll welcome back some guests from the previous seasons of the podcast to get their updated market views, and we'll also be bringing in some new guests to the microphone too. As always, the aim with these podcasts is to give you the opportunity to listen to differing market views and to assist you with your own trading and investing education. So with that in mind, let's get straight into another episode of Talking with Traders. Welcome to another episode of Talking with Traders, and uh, this time I'm delighted to uh, invite a new guest onto the podcast. His name is Mark Perchtold, or Perch, as you're more uh, commonly known in the industry. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Uh, it's good to be chatting to you, and I'll start out the conversation by saying that probably 25 years ago, you and I might not have wanted to have too much to say to one another, because uh, you are a cares boy, and I'm a park town boy, and our schools were big rivals. But uh, it's twenty five years later. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Garth. Yeah, we 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 we, we were massive rivals back in the day. Um, yeah. But it's it's interesting when you move overseas how a lot of the the big school rivalries in South Africa um, actually bring a lot of the the old boys together when you yeah. back over the side. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, funnily enough, you know, when I started at Varsity, I didn't know anybody else because I did a, a gap year after matric. So I arrived at Varsity, didn't know anybody else in the class. And the first guy that I kind of struck up a conversation actually was a cares boy because we actually had something in common being boys, school boys and, you know, sport and all of that kind of thing. And you're right. So the, the rivalry ultimately becomes like a camaraderie later on in life, I suppose. It's all good. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about markets. We're here to talk about what you're doing. Um, you are the founder, one of the founders, I think, of Umber Investments and Advisory. Uh, you're based in London as well. You've been yeah. in London for quite a long time. Um, obviously, I'm also here in London and uh, and not as long as you, though. You've been here for many, many years. I've only been here for three years. But give us a little bit of background, Mark, into your your career so far. You know, take us, obviously, what happened after you finished at Kez? Tell us from that point onwards and how you got to where you are today. Jeez, that's quite a far, far trip back. But <laughs> um, yeah, I finished at, at King Edwards and then went off to Wits University, um, studied chartered accountancy, um, took corporate finance as an extra subject at uni because I always had a keen interest in, in finance and markets. My first share trading portfolio was uh, opened in 1998, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I started dabbling with, um, with trading of stocks and, and, you know, experienced the boom and bust of the, of the tech bubble. Um, then I finished my articles, went overseas to Atlanta, Georgia for a stint in the States on a secondment, which was fantastic. And that sort of got the travel bug in me and I wanted to, to work and, and travel abroad. So Moved over to the to London and the United Kingdom um, a year after articles, really. And uh, at the time, joined, as many accountants did, who were coming over a big bank in an accounting role doing boring debits and credits, uh, mm -hmm. while actually still running my, my trading account, which I was allowed to do because I was a contractor. And um, the bank I worked for was Goldman Sachs. And, and then there was a role as a financial analyst on, on one of the desks in the investment management division. And um, the role included a lot of, you know, talking about markets to clients, you know, presenting ideas to them from a brokerage point of view and also running some of the portfolios that, that we dealt with. So it was a real pivot from debits and credits into what I really enjoyed, which was financial markets. So unfortunately, and actually going back to that time, I, I think I still had my, my BOE account open and dealt with your desk yeah. um, in South Africa. That's, that's how far right. back we go. Yes, and, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, I remember dealing with you as a client of ours when I was running the desk at BOE. I didn't have much money in my account. It was a, I was a very small client, but I, I enjoyed it. I think at the, at the time of arriving in the UK, I only had 5,000 pounds to my name in, in liquid assets. So it was it was pretty small, but you know, it's obviously been a, a long journey in investing in, in markets. But um, 
Yeah, I spent 12 years at Goldman Sachs Investment Management Division, um, dealing a lot actually with South African clients. So traveled back to South Africa at least 10 times a year in some years. So I haven't sh been able to shake my Joburg accent. I've, I've been here 18 years, but, but can't, can't shake it. And, you know, during my time at Goldman, obviously saw a lot of different things from, from the sort of traditional asset classes like equities and fixed income to all the derivatives there on, um, you know, private equity, hedge funds, you know, real estate, liquid and illiquid assets, and got a really good overview of what it's, what the landscape for in, investors looks like in, in international markets. But one of the things that I'd, I'd noticed was growing and, and continued to boom was, was the growth of ETFs. And so we had been building multi-asset portfolios for clients, but most of those would have been populated with either securities directly, so, so shares and bonds or funds managed by professionals, either in-house product or third-party product or structured products coming out of the securities division of the, of, of the, of the bank um, and various other things. But very few of those portfolios embraced ETFs. And one of the things I really liked about ETFs was they were liquid. You know, you could trade them intraday. They were inherently diversified by number of securities therein. And you could actually express a lot of, you know, multi-asset views or, or country or sector views using ETFs at the time. And, and, and obviously that's evolved further now with the likes of th thematic and smart beta. Yeah. So I set up Omber in, in 2017 with uh, David Pearson, who I knew from Wits University. He, he studied information systems um, and he had been working in financial services in London for many years in big tech integrations and, and rollouts and sort of a lot of middle and back office tech related work and had complementary skills to me, having been more on the investing side and, and client-facing side of things. So had a you know very complementary skill set. We decided that we wanted to build a, a firm that was differentiated in, in the use of ETFs. And you know how can you be an active manager but use a passive tool set? And so we thought there were very few people doing it at the time who weren't tied to a big house. So you had you know ETF solutions from BlackRock and Vanguard and the like, but that would only be their own product. Yeah. Very few were using any of the product out there. And so we got going in, in Jan 17 and, you know, fast forward just over five and a half years now and we're, we're up and running. Yeah, well, that's great. What a, what a great story. The The reason I really did want to speak to you exactly was because of this thematic ETF um, idea that you guys are, are specialized in. I think it's very exciting. As you say, I mean, particularly here in the developed world, ETFs are huge. Um, in, in South Africa, yeah, there's ETFs and people know the Satrix 40 and a couple of the other ETFs. And I mean, it's, it is a, a, it, it's an industry that has grown in South Africa as well. But um but in terms of the global markets, I mean, it's incredible the amount of themes that you can get. You know, I, I also follow a lot of ETFs. I look at things like the, there's cannabis ETFs, there's natural gas, there's wheat, there's corn, there's, you know, um, things like ARC, the Kathy Wood funds, if you want some of the growth, the, the racy growth tech stuff. Um, and then, of course, there's also inverse ETFs and leveraged ETFs. I mean, the, the exchange traded fund world over here in, in well, in the UK and, and particularly in the US is is huge. So absolutely, I mean, I think the opportunity that you spotted to to build a business around ETFs and ETF investing is, is certainly the way forward. But how often, how actively do you manage your client portfolios of ETFs? I mean, are you are you switching out in, in and out of ETFs quite regularly or do you tend to hold for quite a long time? What's the sort of strategy? It's a good question, Garth. I mean, I know we on Traders Corner here, we're, we're, not, we're not traders per se. We're more investors, but obviously through any investment, you need to put on a trade yeah. and it's a view you're expressing. Typically, our, our views when we tilt a portfolio, as we would call it, would be ideally three to 18 month views. You know, we're not in it for a short term, one week turn on our position or even intraday um, because there are dealing costs. The way our business is set up, we can either deal at third party banks and custodians or our own internal platform. And so, you know, there's, there are costs to trade. So we're not in and out in, in that sense. So we probably in any given year would express somewhere between, let's just say within equities, maybe six to 10 ideas. And yeah. within fixed income, maybe three to five. And, I, and I'm averaging here in a, mm. in a year like the COVID year and a, a year like this year, there might be more turnover and, and, and changes within a portfolio only because there are different opportunities that present yeah. themselves and markets are swinging, swinging more wildly. So 
you know, historically, as you as you correctly touched on there, you know, you had country and 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 regional ETFs available to investors, and and then within developed markets, you have sectoral ETFs. Thematics are not actually that new. Many have been around for 10 plus years and, and some of them have got 10 year plus track records. So some of the sort of clean energy and decarbonization related ETFs yeah. have been around for a very long time. You can you can put together sort of a mega trend and say, okay, aging populations is a theme. You know, if you invest in, in that theme or that mega trend, you could use a traditional healthcare ETF to express a view because there's a demand for healthcare as people get older, for example. So mm. the, the growth in thematics has allowed one to express a bit of a nuanced view on a on a particular theme. So if you wanted more exposure to cybersecurity because you're worried about the Russia-Ukraine invasion and therefore demand for more cyber protection, you could express a very specific view. Um, you, you've got a, a swathe of, of ETFs in the sort of clean energy space. You know, there are tens, if not hundreds available across mm-hmm. different parts of that. You know, whether you're looking at the battery value chain or you're looking at wind and solar or you know, desalinization. So thematics have absolutely boomed and that's just increased our tool set in a way because there are over 8,000 ETFs in the world now yeah. and the wow. fastest growing in terms of new issues is thematics. Part of that is is because of, you know, I think a lot of the industry have realized ETFs are a low cost and fantastic tool to express a, a view in markets and they've cannibalized a lot of the margin from, from traditional long only managers. And so product houses have said, well, let's try earn some margin. Let's put together some interesting baskets of stocks that track an index, which we can often create ourselves. Yeah. And now you've also got active ETFs, which is another evolution yeah. and, and charge a higher fee on that ETF. But mm. there's a lot of work that goes into understanding what's under the hood. And so we've built some technology internally using Python to really look at every single underlying holding within the ETFs, various financial metrics that a traditional investor would look at relating to those underlying companies and aggregate it, look at how it contributes to the VAR or to the VOL or to max potential drawdown on a portfolio or position level. And then really understand, is this what we want to add to a portfolio? Is this trade right? Is this trade giving us that purity of expression that we really want? Because some of the thematics are actually just a headline sexy theme but actually, when you look underneath, they're not, they're not pure in their expression. And one example would be cyber, actually. One of the ETFs we looked at, it held uh, top two holdings were Accenture and Cisco. Now, oh. I would argue Accenture and Cisco are not pure cyber companies at all. Mm. And, you know, you wouldn't get good purity of expression there. So, you know, it got us on a journey of really trying to you know, understand what's, what's inside these thematics. So, I'll talk a little bit about our, our thematic solution maybe later, but... Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, well, let's talk about it now. Um, I have got another question that I'll come back to on 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 that, um, what you were talking about a minute ago. But I mean, in terms of the solution, let's just quickly talk about that. Assume, let's just make an assumption. I'm a client, I come to you and I've got, I don't know if you have any minimums at your firm, but let's just say I've got 50,000 pounds and I want to invest it with you guys. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I presume you look at my age and stage of life and all, but take me through the process. I mean, what does it look like? What, what what kind of process do you follow to then decide what in what ETFs you're going to put me into? So we we on our segregated account business, our minimums are pretty high. They're actually a million pounds, a million euros, oh. a million dollars, and upwards. Okay. And we'll run a segregated account. And the the journey there is that the clients onboard directly with us. Right. We get to know them. We do a suitability and appropriateness assessment, as is required by the regulators. We really get to understand the client's ability and willingness to take risk. And they may be in a dollar portfolio, a euro portfolio, or pound portfolio. Um, and the bonds with the investment grade bonds would typically match the base currency. Mm-hmm. Um, high yield and, and EM bonds would not necessarily match the base currency. And then equi- our equity view is a view across every single portfolio we have. Um, and that would be for a segregated account client. But what happened and sort of the evolution of our business was that a lot of people, friends, family, et cetera, said, you know, Mark, I like what you guys are doing. This is great. I like ETFs. I've read about them. I don't know where to start. They're 8,000. I want to put a portfolio together. Can I invest with you? And the answer was, well, sorry, for 50 grand, you can't because our minimum is much higher. Mm. So we unitized our, our, our dollar moderate risk strategy, which is a flexible strategy where we can go as low as 30% equity and as high as 70. And we unitized it in an Irish usage fund. And that's available to investors on on uh, many platforms in the UK and, and some platforms in South Africa where they can invest into that fund. 
and okay. we would be managing the underlying ETF. So it's a fund of ETFs okay. with, with a cap total expense ratio. So what we also did uniquely was say, we want to embrace this low cost building block being an ETF. We're active managers, but we can't overcharge on fees because that defeats the purpose of wanting to use a passive tool as your instrument. Yeah. So we cap our total expense ratio on the fund as well. And, and our fees only 0.3% on that fund. So the SEG account clients following a dollar moderate risk portfolio would have the same portfolio as a client with five or 10,000 pounds in our moderate risk fund. Okay. So those would be the same. Um, if it was a Euro-based client and wanted a conservative portfolio, then they would have more fixed income and they'd have Euro-based currency bonds. So it'd be slightly different. The thematic side of it is that, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about how we build the thematic yeah. portfolios because- yeah. You know, we've used thematics for a while in our core portfolios, but off the back of client interest, actually, one particular British client we deal with, a private equity guy, he started being curious about ETFs and flicking us articles from the press saying, oh, I saw this cool cannabis ETF or this uranium ETF or the cyber ETF. And it's like, all these themes are so funky. Do you use them in the portfolios? We had been using some. So, you know, for example, clean energy we've used and esports and gaming, um, some of the China internet stuff we've looked at. So we have been using them in our core portfolios, but he said, why don't you put together a portfolio of themes and, and run it for me? And, you know, I'd prefer actually if you did it in a unitized version because it worked out better for his tax. Okay. So that got us on a journey of exploring the seeding of a thematic fund to go and you know, invest in themes and thematic ETFs specifically. And so we sat back and we said, hang on a second, this is very different to what we've done so far. Um, and this goes back now two years, you know, how do we just look at only at thematics? And it was actually an interesting path because do you do 10 themes at 10% weight each or 20 themes at 5% weight? How do you put it all together? And so we've we built a process which is quite lengthy to explain maybe on this call, but we start with the categorization of themes as A, B, or C list. Yeah. We, then each, we then have short lists of ETFs in those particular themes. So we as a, as a firm are watching 40, 45 themes across maybe 150 different thematic ETFs. And then we've got a short list of theme of ETFs that fit the theme, but then you got to choose which ones. So in cyber, we had shortlisted four. Two of them were almost identical because they tracked the same underlying index, just different issuers. Mm. Then another one was much more expensive. Then the other one didn't have purity. And then so we, we when we looked at the underlying ETF, there were qualitative things we looked at, like who's the issuer? Are they credible? Are there tight bid offer spreads and trading? What's the market cap? You know, is is most dealing done in the primary or secondary market? You know, what are the tax consequences? Do we Is there an accumulation and distribution class it, it, amongst 20, 30 checks? And we rank, we basically quintiled each characteristic. So how did it score based on those characteristics? An example being iShares would rank first quintile on issuer credibility, Vanguard mm -hmm. first quintile, whereas maybe a lesser known, I won't name a lesser known one because that yeah. would be unfair to them, but a lesser known ETF product provider might score in the bottom quintile. Similarly with like level of AUM. Um, and then we look under the hood of the ETF and we want to understand what percentage of companies in the ETF are loss making. If that's a high percentage, it scores badly. What's the average multiple, you know, price to book, price to earnings, price to cash flow, various traditional financial metrics. And again, quintile it based, quintile the, the ETFs based on the stock holdings underneath and how they score. Right. And then looking at liquidity and average daily trading volume or 30 day average daily trading volume. And so, from that process, we then have a good understanding of whether an ETF should score up or score mm. down. And therefore, you could get to your top pick out of four in that example of cyber and say, that's the cyber one we want. Okay, right. So now we know it's, it's an A-list theme. Therefore, it's got to be within a certain tolerance range, which is higher. So we mm. have the A-list themes get a bigger white, uh, band for their weighting with a low and a high or min-max. The B's a lower min-max, C's a lower min-max. And then you got to say, okay, let's let's now put it together. So we we score them either negatively or positively based on the ranking, right. and then we run a mean variance optimization tool over it to optimize for Sharpe ratio. But it's also more complex than that because you've got to sometimes backfill and use a proxy index because the ETF doesn't have uh, the index didn't exist for long because it's mm. new, yeah. and so you've got to try find an appropriate proxy. And then that's when human judgment comes into the final phase, saying. This ETF scores phenomenally because its three-year track record's for great and da, da 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 But actually, you know, we use backfill data here, and we know that that early period it needs to be 
discounted. And so you make a human judgment error. Right. Uh, you avoid a, 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 an error there by using human judgment. Yeah. So sizing down or up. And that, that allowed us to build a portfolio of thematic ETFs. But then it sort of took us into the single stock world where you could look under the hood and, and we had a process where we checked the top 10 holdings of every single ETF, mm. wanted to understand the companies in the top 10 at a sort of more detailed level. And there were sometimes companies which you're like, I've, we've got to have more of this. You know, it, right. at, if it's 10% weight in the portfolio and it's only 10% weight of the you know, ETF, you're looking at a 1% weight in your overall portfolio. And we actually said, well, this one, we want 2% or 3% weight yeah. in our portfolio. So we've started in, in recent months adding single stocks, which still fit into themes into our portfolio process. Yeah. Okay. Because that actually was going to be my next question to you is you, you, know, you referred to under the hood and looking at the component stocks in each of these ETFs. And I was thinking about it so from a slightly different way, I suppose, where you've said you, you might identify a stock within an ETF that you really like and you want to build a bigger position in it. But I guess the counter argument could be that if you come across an ETF and you find that you know you like the theme, but there's a one or two rubbish companies in there that you don't necessarily want to own, and is there a case to be made for then recreating the ETF yourself? Okay, and it's not an ETF because it's you know you. you but what I'm saying is, create the same basket of stocks, but leave out the ones that you don't own or you don't want to own, um, and and you know because this is something I've thought about in terms of my own investing is along the lines of thematic ETF investing, but but almost try and optimize those ETFs to be even better. So like you said, you know, you want a bit of a bigger weighting to certain stocks that you really like, but then there may be a couple in the in the ETF that you don't like at all and you would rather not own. Can you then create your own ETF or your own basket, which essentially gives you the ability to optimize or even some sort of an outperformance of the actual ETF that you're tracking? I think you could if you if you're big enough yeah. and your dealing costs are low enough as a as a firm because yeah. obviously it's a, it's about scaling. So yeah. you, there are certainly cases where you look under the hood and you see the bottom ten companies in terms of how we rank them. Maybe we say the bottom ten are all loss making. They've never turned a profit. They trade at ridiculous multiples of revenue. They have no E. They've only yeah. got the the revenue or the yeah. sales, yeah. and you don't really want to own too much. And so. Often that that's one of the exclusion criteria that where we wouldn't even own the ETF at all because you know perhaps different to say some of the ARC funds where yeah. if you look at the underlying stocks in the, the ARC portfolio they're great underlying companies great mm -hmm. stories and revenue is growing at rampant pace but the companies have never turned a profit yeah now that's very different to our process we we would only want to buy more of ones where we know there's there's a history and track record of earnings mm -hmm. and maybe they've had a rough patch recently but the company's sound and stable. So you could you could try strip out uh, if you if you look under the hood of our thematic fund you you're probably looking at 800 to 1000 underlying companies as yeah. it stands today. Yeah. Now to recreate that is quite yeah. difficult. Yeah. Not only because of the number of securities but also the exchanges on which many of them trade. So you'd have to open up trading lines into many Asian markets, you know, across Europe, across US, LATAM included, whereas the ETF issuers and, and the, you know, the authorized participants that create and redeem units and the, the liquidity providers that allow for trading in these ETFs, they've already got all that market infrastructure in place. And so it's often just much easier to buy the ETF, yeah. which is one of the reasons they charge a fee, which sure. is why you'll find some emerging market or obscure market ETFs are much more expensive than your traditional S&P 500 or FTSE 100, et cetera, because mm. it's the cost of setting up your market infrastructure. And yeah. so it's it's theoretically possible yeah but i don't think you want to go down that route unless you've got i don't know half a billion a billion yeah. dollars or pounds therein and you're able to open up trading lines into all those markets right. but we use it more as an exclusion uh, process than an inclusion process where we rather upsize our weights yeah. and if if we don't want that etf we'll just exclude it completely yes Okay. All right. Very interesting. Now, of course, I mentioned it earlier on in the in the podcast, but with the the ETF world taking off as as it has, you've also got uh, like derivatives of the ETFs. In other words, you've got you know short ETFs, right? So you can you can buy ETFs that do the opposite to whatever the asset is. You can buy like an inverse S and P five hundred ETF, yeah. and there are lots of these kind of things. And then you get these these um, 
leveraged ones as well, where you can get two times or three times gearing on uh, on on the under in underlying index, both on the upside or the downside, depending on how you want to play it. Do you take it? Do you make use of any of that sort of more fancy stuff like the short ETFs or the inverse ETFs, or, or, or any leveraged. of the leveraged ones? No, we don't. So, so all our ETFs are, are currently physically backed. Although there's actually nothing wrong with synthetic ETFs these days; yeah. they're very well capitalized and, and collateralized, I should say, in terms yeah. of the collateral held against those assets. Um, and and that's a very conscious decision. We we don't we don't have permission from our clients to to short, and and our funds aren't permitted to short. Okay. And furthermore, you know the you know the leveraged ones are volatile, yeah. extremely volatile. So it adds a lot of vol to the portfolio. Yeah. But having said that, I, you know, I have dabbled in, in, in my prior life, you know, in my personal capacity where I did invest in, in the leveraged ones, but those were often with a much shorter sort of trading view. Mm -hmm. So if on Friday, for example, you took a view that next week the market was going to bounce as it's done now, yeah. you might've put on a three times levered upside, you know, participation ETF and yeah. happy days, yeah. you would have done well. Um, and then you could close your position. But over time, the, the costs embedded in those products often hurt you. Yeah. Even if markets are trending up, you, you don't necessarily get, if you have starting point A and, and ending point B, and you've got a, you draw a straight line of what your theoretical return should have been between yeah. those, yeah. you do not get three times your, let's say it was up 10%, you don't get three times 10% equals 30 mm. because of all the embedded costs on the daily trading within the, within yeah. the ETF themselves and the cost of the, the funding, the funding. Within the ETF. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've noticed when I've when I've done a bit of backtesting on some of those leveraged ETFs as well, is that there's a lot of, they're actually very expensive to trade. Um, exactly. And there's also, as you said, the funding or the time decay element of, it's not really time decay because that's not the right term, it's the funding element, um, which definitely eats into the, the performance. So but, exactly. But Short term for traders, absolutely useful yeah. tool. Well, that's it. For a short term tool, I guess it's great. And I mean, when I look at some of those um, leveraged ETFs and the volumes that those those things trade in are huge in some cases, like tens of millions of shares a day in, in some of those, like the leveraged S&P 500 ETFs, for example. So it's clearly a very, very popular trading product. But as you say, I mean, not for the type of strategy you guys are trying to employ. And, um, and I guess, as you'll know, you know, maybe better than me, there are different ways to trade a market. If you want to express a long S&P 500 view, you mm -hmm. can use a, a levered ETF or you can yeah. also use you know, futures or CFDs yeah. or, or other yeah. solutions, which maybe give you more leverage yeah. and are super liquid. And you can maybe express a several hour view. You know, you yes. trade on the open and you exit three hours later. Yeah. I would argue maybe an ETF is not the optimal way to do that mm. so it depends mm. on your trading lines and, and sure and the rest. yeah yeah absolutely there's many many different products to achieve a, a similar thing and what about options because again uh with the evolution of etfs and the fact that lots of them are very liquid i mean there's now also quite an active options market around a lot of etfs and I know I trade some of those options my, myself. I mean, do you get involved with that? Do you, where you create hedges or structures around some of your portfolios using options? Well, we're actually looking at potentially developing a new product, which will include the use of options in, within a fund format. It's quasi hedge fund like, um, yeah. where you, you're writing options to take in premium or you're selling covered calls to, to take profit or enhance income. Um, but the, the, the great thing about the evolution of ETF options is that you know, a lot of them are physically settled. So you, you physically settle into the ETF. So I use them with my own money and we actually have a, a couple options advisory mandates where clients pass a retainer to advise them on their, their options. So okay. they will be trading away from us with their yeah. own brokers and banks, et cetera. Yeah. But they look to us for some guidance on what tenors and strikes and moneyness and all the rest of it to, to look at. And the, the nice thing about the ETF options is that instead of having to cash settle on maturity, if you're out of the money, mm. you're physically settled yeah. um, and you're, you're now potentially longer position. So, I, you know, I've used them myself quite a bit to, to write options on large underlying indices, you know, where or ETFs like S&P 500 or yeah. you know, the SMI or the DAX or whatever. Just saying sometimes I've used these these um, ETF options to, to write you know, cash covered options on, on underliers where I'm happy to go along that underlie at a certain future point. Right. And instead of being cash settled, I'll be physically settled into the underlying ETF. Right. And I'm now long an ETF at a, at a level I'm happy to, to go long. Uh, almost like I always think of it psychologically as like it's a limit order to buy. 
Yeah. But I'm being paid to wait. Yes. So as you get your time decay on the option premium, mm. you're getting paid to wait for your limit to be hit. Yeah. Instead of just putting in a limit and not getting paid. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's philosophically, I've always loved cash covered put writing. Yeah. Um, and the, the nice thing about the evolution of ETF options is now you go along that underlier. Yes. And and then you've got a physically a physical ETF, and and you could do it on many big indices now. You know, S and P 500, the DAX, the yeah. the SMI in Switzerland, the FTSE 100, etc. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I mean, as we draw towards the, I don't know, the final sort of quarter of this interview, I suppose, let's talk a little bit about the market environment currently. Um, and we're recording this it's the 4th of October, 2022, who, for anyone who watches this at a later date. Um, and I try to keep these podcasts relatively evergreen, but at the same time, it's also useful to occasionally bring in a little bit of current uh, market view. When we've seen... The S and P five hundred has just been down. It's tested the June low again. It's bouncing right now as we speak. Seasonally, this is quite a bullish time of the year, typically. But and you can't always trust those seasonal patterns. But how do you look at it at this point in time? I mean, are you seeing value in the market? Are you a buyer? Are you cautious? What What are you seeing? Garth, I like the way you quoted the date, so you could always go, you said the following, and then look what happened. <laughs> um, so, no yeah, I'm really on the spot here. No pressure. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'll am I'm, give you sort of my high-level views. I'm, I'm definitely a net buyer here than a seller mm. because you can never time the bottom of a market. The market is extremely forward-looking. You yeah. know, a lot of news flow, we, we know, you know, think about Russia-Ukraine invasion. We've got China zero COVID policies. We've got supply chain disruptions. We've got interest rate hikes from all over the world, inflation prints are hot. It's not looking rosy. You're starting to see a slowdown in economic activity. You know, housing market in the US is maturing and slowing down. You could you can easily put together today a very bearish case. Yeah. But that's all known to the market. Right. And that's been priced in already. Earnings mm -hmm. guidance is weak. The companies have been guiding down, which means they're potentially more likely to beat in the next quarter. Mm -hmm. And so I, I look at the environment like now as one to definitely be accumulating risk. But I say that with a pinch of salt. You know, I think it's very possible in the next six to nine months we're down another 10, 15% from here. I say possible. Mm. I don't say likely. Yeah. I think it, I think it's actually unlikely. But if it occurred, it wouldn't shock me. Yeah. And so I wouldn't be deploying any money today as an investor that they weren't willing to stomach another 10, 15% drawdown on. Right. I don't think we're going to necessarily have a GFC style drawdown. Um I don't think there are as big systemic risks in the system as uh, the, you know, the U.S. banking system crumbling, um, and what happened with subprime and you know Lehman, Bear Stearns, and all the rest of them going under. Yeah. I mean, obviously, big news now is what's happening with uh, Credit Suisse in the yeah. news and their credit spreads blowing out, and yeah. you know Deutsche Bank is also touted to have a lot of risk. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult to um, predict how that unfolds, but I don't think they're as systemic as the U.S. banking system. And, you know, when I looked at risks in the world in, in Q4 last year, and as we look forward to this year, you know, the things that I highlighted were a lot of the crypto ecosystem, which I thought, you know, did pose a lot of risks. I think it's almost like the internet bubble and bust where yeah. the internet still exists today and the great yeah. internet businesses. Yeah. But there was a lot of froth in the market and yeah. that froth is now disappearing. Mm -hmm. And there will be a, a sort of ecosystem of blockchain and crypto token world in 10, 15, 20 years from now, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. in the meantime, there's a washout. Mm. And then similarly with a lot of the private lending markets, I think because banks stepped away from risky lending post GFC because of regulations and the requirement to hold all this regulatory capital against positions on their book, they didn't want to do any risky SME lending. And so what's emerged is this private lending market where family offices and private lending funds have stepped into their shoes and often given loans to companies which couldn't get funding from a bank yeah. because they were risky yeah. at attractive rates, but many don't deserve a loan because they're never going to repay it. Yeah. So with this new hiking, you know, hike, hiking cycle we're in, I think a lot of that private lending stuff starts to blow up over the next 18 months. But then again, neither of those are globally systemic. Yeah. And then the last is some of the, the froth in, in venture capital, which you know, you've, you've seen companies being able to raise money off the back of growing revenue, never turned a profit, mm -hmm. five, six, seven, eight years in series, D, E, F, G, eight, nine, 10, whatever. Yeah. And the company's never turned a profit and now they're not going to be able to get funding. So a lot of that, that, that early stage seed investing venture capital world also will feel pain. And so, you know, when I look at the world today, sure, we've had a correction. It could get a little bit worse, but valuations are starting to look attractive. 
Um, yeah. The NASDAQ is now trading at thereabouts. It's 10 year average. So it's not cheap. Mm. Um, you know, the S&P 500 has just dipped into cheapness versus its 10 year average multiples, but many other markets are trading at meaningful discounts to their, their long-term 10 year average and timing the bottom is impossible. So, you know, I'd, I'd say economically we're, we're likely to see inflation abate. Um, you, you know, inflation prints, you've got the base effects obviously, but the yeah. trigger of this big inflation spike has been, you know, zero COVID policies from China, supply chain bottlenecks, Russia, Ukraine invasion, causing a knock-on onto commodity prices and energy prices. Mm. A little bit of wage inflation inputs, which is, is one worry, I guess, wage wage inflation spiral. But the three former points I raised, they, they'll all be, you know, and obviously a lot of money supply driving consumers to spend more, which yeah. has now been drained. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, those are all starting to reverse and supply demand balances in commodities and energy will rectify themselves within, you know, a year or so. Already you're starting to see that's the case because, you know, if supply doesn't come online, demand's going to drop. Absolutely. Yeah. People pay that much for energy. Yeah. And so inflation abates. You've had earnings being guided down by companies and suddenly central banks turn a little bit dovish because we're in a, a deeper recession and the market rips. Yeah. So if anything, I think if you if your horizon is is north of, you know, three years, you're going to look back and say, I wish I bought more during the dip. Yeah. So that's our, that's sort of a higher level view. It's a very convincing view, I must say. So. All right, Mark. It's it's great. That's been great. It's been excellent chatting to you. And just a final wrap up really is um, how do how can listeners or viewers of this podcast get in touch with you? Because you've really actually made a, a very good impression, I think, uh, in terms of the way you look at markets, the thematic ETFs and the products that you've got are very interesting and quite unique. I think there's probably a lot of listeners out there who might be interested in wanting to invest with your firm. So how, how do they get in touch with you? Thanks, Garth. I mean, that's very kind of you. I mean, the, the simplest way is to go to our website and just it's ombainvestments.com. And through various tabs on the website, you can either contact us and, and then someone of the team will, will get in touch with you and, and try to help you out. Or you could potentially invest directly with, um, into the funds that we have in Ireland, which are all Irish usits, um, or check on the platform you use, whether any of our funds are available to you, if you're interested in investing in those. Um, we're not on all the, all the, all the platforms in the UK and South Africa, but we're on a few. So okay. there, there is possibility, but probably a good source is, is the website to begin with. Yeah. Okay. So ombainvestments.com is yeah. the, is O-M-B-A. the easy. O-M-B-A investments.com. There we go. All right. Excellent. Well, Mark, it's really been super speaking to you. Uh, it's been, course, it's been, been fun. And yeah, and I mean, we're both in the UK. I know we bumped into each other at a restaurant a little while ago, but I think it's about time we had another a, a caught up over a pint sometime. It sounds like a plan. All right. You take cool, care, God. Mark. Thanks yeah, very much. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. You're listening to Talking With Traders, a podcast series brought to you by IG, a world leading online trading and investment provider. If you haven't checked out the IG online trading platform, please do so and visit IG.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast series on your favorite podcast app or website by clicking on the subscribe button and you'll be notified weekly as we release new episodes. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders brought to you by IG, a world leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.